like every time I come, I either end up crying or having some kind of vision or something. I don't know if this is just something the Lord was showing me or if it's for somebody here, but I try really hard when the Lord shows me something to not interpret it at all. You just speak it however he showed it to me. So this is what it Amen. was. This we were we were worshiping and there was this lion that was up on a big rock. And down below it it was just dark. And as the lion was standing there it started to roar and when it roared all the darkness blew away. And there were people down there that had been living in this darkness and then it kind of zoomed out and there were angels that were pulling back a veil from the earth. And as they pulled back the veil, the people on the earth were exposed to the light of God. Yes. And they were finally able to be in the direct light of God. And I, I don't know if that's for somebody here or if that's just the Lord showing what he wants to do or what, but... I saw it here, I said it here. <laughs> Y'all that don't know me are going to have to just kind of bear with me today. The people that have heard me preach before and stuff, they understand. It's, I, I just do stuff. <laughs> and say stuff. I went to seminary. They taught me how to act right, but it didn't take. <laughs> I was the student in seminary that was notorious for making people clutch their pearls. <laughs> <laughs> and stuff. I mean, just I, I have a bad habit of kicking people's sacred cows and not apologizing for it. Just Amen. don't have a problem with it. Take it up with God. He's the one said it. Yeah. You know, but we're we're really excited. We just got done doing a few months of Tent Revival up in Kirbyville, Missouri. We were up there, did services for 81 days straight. Wow. And it was great. A lot of people showed up. The Lord just kept sending people and sending them. And they were people getting saved, people getting filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, set free. It was, it was a great time in the Lord. But we went there and we set up that tent. And we had no idea why the Lord sent us to Kirbyville. We just knew we were supposed to go. He didn't give us any kind of outline or a plan. He didn't give us some kind of mandate. There wasn't any thus saith the Lord. When we went, it was just kind of a quiet, look, I want you to put the tent up this year, and this is the place there is to set it up. So just go and put your tent there. And we prayed about it, and we tried to get some kind of plan from the Lord, tried to tell us. Get him to tell us why we were going out there. What are we supposed to do? How long are we going to be there? And he said, just go. And so we did. And I just realized I forgot to pray. So we'll pray. <laughs> I told you. I just do stuff. <laughs> it's all right. The presence of God here. <laughs> and Father, we thank you for this time that we've given us together. Lord, we thank you for the people that you've gathered here, for the people that you've drawn to this place. Father, we thank you that you use us, that you work in us and through us. Father, I ask that you speak through me today because we all know that without you, I have nothing worth saying. Yeah. I told you, I just do stuff. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if the Lord uses me. I can never do stuff the way I'm supposed to. <laughs> Professionalism is just a word I know. <laughs> we went out there and the Lord just told us to go. You know, and sometimes the Lord's going to do that to you. Sometimes he's going to tell you to go and you're going to say, well, why am I going? Where am I going? What am I going to do when I get there? And he's just not going to tell you. Amen. There's times in our lives that, that we miss out on opportunities and on blessings because we want to know the whole plan. Mm -hmm. You see, even, even in our walk with Christ, he tells us how to get saved. He gives us this Bible to follow and he says in the end you're going to get to heaven. But he doesn't tell you the whole walk that you're going to go through. That's right. 
He doesn't tell you the mountains and the valleys. He doesn't tell you the rivers and the lakes and the oceans that you're going to have to swim across. He doesn't tell you, by the way, when you get to this point in your walk, you're going to be thoroughly convinced that I'm about to drown. <laughs> by the way, you're going to get to this part of your walk and it's going to get really, really hard and you're going to just want to quit it. You're going to get to this part of your walk and you are going to be convinced with every fiber of your being that I left you. You're going to get to this part of your walk and everything, absolutely everything is going to fall apart. Amen. You see, but he doesn't tell us any of that. And I think that part of it is just because if I knew what my walk with the Lord was going to look like, I just said, forget it. Forget it. You didn't put enough in here telling me what heaven is going to be like to make me feel like it's worth what I'm going to have to go through. Amen. Follow the word. I don't see the love in that. I don't see the grace and the mercy in that. So he doesn't always give us the plan. He just says, look, get in the car and go. Yep. Amen. Amen. One of the analogies I use for people is, you know, we have, we have two kinds of friends, or at least I have two kinds of friends. I have the kind that, you know, we're friends. <laughs> but if you say we're going someplace, where are we going? How long are we going to be gone? Who are we going to be with? What's the likelihood that you're going to find some bunny trail somewhere? <laughs> and if you can't give me that information, no. I don't want to go anywhere. I don't want to do nothing. They called me out. Do you have any plans for today? No. You want to go on a road trip? Where are we going? Well, we're just going to go. I have plans. <laughs> and then we have the other kind of friend my best friend calls me sometimes and, and we go places together and she called me one day and she said you want to go on a road trip and my response was woo road trip yeah. I have no idea where we're going we didn't even go where I thought we were going I thought she's going into the military at the time and I thought well we're probably going to drive down to Fort Leonard Wood and get her uniform because she's supposed to be putting in her packet to be a chaplain and all of this stuff. She needs to go get this stuff. I don't know. We ended up in Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> Doing a Toys for Tots drive. I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> I did not plan on going to a football game, but all right. I don't even like football. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see? <laughs> but we have to decide, you got to decide what kind of friend God's going to be. Yeah. Amen. You see, the reason I'm al I allow myself to do that kind of stuff with that friend is because there's been some trust built there. Mm -hmm. I know her. We understand each other. And I've learned to trust her. See, she's the kind of friend that I know you're not going to put me in a situation that's not for my good. You're not going to put me where I'm with people that I don't need to be with. Amen. You're not going to take me someplace that I don't want to go. You might take me to a football game when I'm not a football fan. But this isn't someplace where I just I don't want to be here. I can feel in my spirit this is wrong. She wouldn't do that to me. Amen. You see, sometimes though we treat God like the other friend. Like somehow in our lives, he's not earned our trust. Well, I don't know. I don't know that I trust you mm -hmm. to not take me someplace that I don't want to go. Yeah. I don't know that I trust you to make me do stuff that I don't want to do. And I understand that mentality. I used to be completely ridiculous with that. I was so scared when I was in college to hand my life over to the Lord. Just in the area of finding me a husband. I could not hand my life over to that and just say, Lord, your will be done. And my fear was absolutely ridiculous. Well, what if you give me somebody, though, and I don't like him? <laughs> what? <laughs> right? <laughs> What if I don't even think he's cute? Like, I'm scared you're going to give me somebody ugly and stupid. And then what am I going to do? Now I'm stuck with this dude the rest of my life because God said. <laughs> I'm telling you, I like to say that I'm making it up. But these are real conversations I had with the Lord. <laughs> I couldn't believe 
that the Lord had a good person picked out for me. Yes. This is somebody you're going to like. You're going to think they look good. They smell good. They act good. You're going to enjoy your life with them. They're going to be good for you. Even when you think they're bad for you, they're being good for you. We have to come to a place where we trust the Lord. Where even when we come to a situation where it feels like I don't see the good in this. All I see is I'm getting hurt. All I see is I'm getting all my flaws pointed out and exposed. All I see is Linnea's not good enough. Linnea doesn't work hard enough. Linnea's not smart enough. All I see is my shortcomings and you put me here. See, but the Lord uses that to bring things out in us. And to purge things from us. You see, I feel like I'm not good enough because I'm dependent on me. And what I can do. I feel like I'm not smart enough because I'm leaning on my own understanding and my own wisdom. I feel like I can't do this because I'm trusting in my own abilities. And the Lord will purposely put you in places that are beyond your ability. We like to say, as though it's a verse in the Bible, the Lord will not give you more than you can handle. Yes, He can. If you've never been in a situation where the Lord put more on your plate than you could eat, it's because you're not running hard enough after the Lord. He will purposely put you in a situation where you're way out of your comfort zone, where this is way beyond what I'm capable of. Because his point is not I'm going to bring you to a place where you can eat everything on this plate. Where you can do everything I've called you to do. His point is I'm going to bring you to a place where you know you can't do this and you have to depend on me. Amen. Yeah. Oh, no. mm -hmm. the word. Why does the Lord have such a strong propensity to use people that are terrible public speakers to be preachers? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Moses stuttered. Almost every major preacher you have ever listened to, if you hear their life story, they are terrible public speakers. They did not like getting up in front of people. They're not good at writing speeches. It's not something that the world would look at them in high school and say, yeah, that's what this person's going to do. Nobody would have looked at me in high school and said, yeah, Linnea's going to be a preacher. I hated getting up in front of people, but he uses people that are bad public speakers to preach because then they know it's not me doing this. And I can't do this without God. I don't have the charisma. I don't have the ability. I don't have the smarts to do this without God. Come on now. That's freaking long. So he'll take you places and he'll not tell you the plan. Not because he's being mean. But because he wants you to learn to trust. Do you believe that I'll take you to good places to do things you want to do to make your dreams come true? Do you believe that I'll never leave you or forsake you? Or is that just something you say when everything's going good because it sounds right? <clears throat> Sometimes he'll take, call you to things and not give you the ultimate plan. I want you to go do this thing for me. Well, why? Just do it. Sometimes you go and you do things for the Lord and you have no idea why you're there, what you're doing. And it may seem on the surface like you're not accomplishing anything, but sometimes you're accomplishing things in the spirit that don't show up in the flesh. Sometimes on the surface it seems like nothing's happening, but in the spirit there's deep change going on. It's just like planting a seed. You go put a seed in the ground, you don't immediately see the sprout come up. For a long time, it looks like there's absolutely nothing happening. And when you act like a little kid, like I do with stuff, you want to go out there and dig it up a little bit. Is something happening? Is it alive? Is it even good seed? You see, but there's a time when that seed's in the ground that it has to crack open. It has to send out roots. And if it doesn't, it'll die. Sometimes the Lord's going to call you to things and he's sending out roots. He's building foundations. Another picture for you is the foundation of a house. 
You see, we get caught up doing in ministry, doing ministry, and we like the house and the decor and all the fancy stuff. It's rare that you ever run across somebody who has the knowledge to go and look at a house and go down in the basement and look at the foundation and stand back and go, yeah, that's a good foundation. Look at that. That's really nice. You use the good cinder blocks. Lines are so straight, you can hang a picture. You can use that for a level. Look how strong that is. Look how well it's built. People don't do that. Nobody cares about your foundation when they come over to your house. They don't want to go look at the basement and see what you got going on down there. Man, that's good pipes you got going on there. Somebody knew what they were doing. They put that plumbing in there. That's a good electrical you got up in your attic. All the boxes are right where they're supposed to be. There's no wires just going everywhere. It's all neat. Nobody ever looks at that stuff. What do they do? They come into your house. Look at the furniture. The furniture is really nice. Look at that banister. Look at that dual post on the end. It's all carved and everything. That's beautiful. And we get caught up in that kind of stuff. And when we're doing ministry, we get caught up in the furnishings and the finishings of the house. And we ignore our foundation. The problem is, if a storm comes, that fancy new post isn't going to hold up your house. Amen. Your couch isn't going to keep the house standing. Amen. You can have the fanciest ninja blender they have at Walmart. That's not going to help you when a tornado comes. Amen. What's going to help you is the structure of the house, the parts that nobody cares about, that everybody ignores. What kind of foundation do you have? What kind of structure is inside these walls? What's the actual house made from? You see, finishings and stuff, that's just dressing. You see, we look at people and we look at ministry and say, well, I want, I want people to look at me, though, and say, well, look at what she's doing. But it's just the dressings of the house. Sometimes God's going to call you to things and it's going to be a place where you're building foundation. You're doing the stuff that nobody's ever going to care about. Nobody's ever going to look at and say, wow, what a craftsman you are. Mm -hmm. It's never going to be an antique that somebody pays thousands and thousands of dollars for. It's never going to be the cherished item. It's never going to be trendy. But the Lord will use you to build something that all the trend, all the fashion, all the furnishings in the world couldn't be there without what you did. With no recognition, no pat on the back. Sometimes he doesn't tell us the plan because if we knew that's what you're going to do, if you're going to be the guy that lays the foundation stone, you're going to be the person that your whole job is to go around and make sure that all these rocks are level, you wouldn't go. Now, I'm not condemning anybody for that. I get the same way. It's like, well, if nobody's going to pat me on the back and say, good girl, I don't want to do it. <laughs> the Lord will send you places and He'll keep providing for you. Sometimes... We have to learn to put our trust in Him. And even when it seems on the surface like nothing's happening, the Lord's working. Mm -hmm. And when we step out in faith, even when we step out and it seems like we have no means to do what the Lord's called us to do. We have no means to accomplish what the Lord's called me to accomplish. He'll send people. He'll send the means. When we were out at the tent, there was a man named Ebenezer that showed up one day with his friend Michael. And he really stuck in my mind because Ebenezer is kind of an odd name these days. It's like I thought people quit naming their boys that in like 18-something. <laughs> I mean, we haven't had an Ebenezer in the family since my great-great-great-grandpa. Yep. And so after he left the first time, I looked it up. And it turns out Ebenezer is a biblical name and it means stone of help. I knew it was in the Bible. And so I looked it up. Ebenezer means stone of help. That's going to be important in this story here. So he shows up and he's talking to me and Dell, and he's got this buddy Michael and they're kind of messianic in their beliefs and stuff. And so 
So they were telling us about, you know, that Jesus' real name was Yeshua and that God is Yehovah and all this. And I'm just, okay, well, you, you're not really telling me anything. I don't know, but this seems really important to you, so I'm going to let you teach me. <laughs> and we stood out there and we were talking in the tent for a long time. And then they left and I was like, well, what was that all about? Because Dell and I believe that, you know, whoever gets sent out to this tent, they're either sent to minister to us or we're, they're here for us to minister to them. And they didn't really seem to need anything. And they didn't really say mm -hmm. anything to us that was real profound or life changing. Was, What's that all about? And the Lord told me to look up his name. And so, OK, I'm going to look it up, but I'm just going to let you know I have a very strong suspicion that if I made him show me his driver's license, that ain't even his real name. I don't know what that's all about. <laughs> he looks like an Eric. <laughs> so I looked it up and I found out it was meant stone of hell. And we didn't see him for several days after that. But then there was one day we were in the tent and one person showed up for service. And I'm standing there, and we're getting ready to, to go, and it's getting close to where we have to start worship service, and my worship leader, Anna, was there, and I'm looking at my watch, and I'm waiting. It's like, well, we'll wait five more minutes and see if anybody else shows up. Mm -hmm. Five minutes go by, and I'm like, we'll wait five more minutes. And 7.10 comes by, and I'm like, all right, we, we have to just start. And so we're doing worship service, and I'm talking to the Lord, and I'm going, and I said, Lord... If you want me to preach to one person tonight, I will. Because you taught me a long time ago, you preach to one person like you preach to a hundred, like you preach to a thousand, like you preach to ten thousand. So if you want me to preach my heart out to one person tonight, I'll do it. But it'd be real nice if I had just a few more people to preach to. Next thing I know, here comes this truck. And I thought it was my mom and dad at first, that the truck that looks a lot like theirs. And there's a circle drive where you're at, and it pulls around a circle, and back on the tailgate it says, Yahweh saves. Here comes Ebenezer. <laughs> Two carloads full of people. They come in the tent, and I had a group of people to preach to that night. The Lord will provide for you. Even when it's something silly. Even when it's something that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter in the end whether I have one person or 20 people to preach to. It doesn't matter. But the Lord saw it. You know, it's going to make you feel a little better if you got a few more people tonight. So I'll send Ebenezer to go gather some people up. So we get towards the end of the revival. And I was praying, talking to the Lord. And I said, all right, Lord, well, whenever we get home, you're going to have to help me out. Because we already took all the food out of our house and brought it up here to the tent because we didn't want it to go bad or anything. And so we brought it all down here to the tent. We've been here for 80 days and so we've eaten it all in my cabinets, my fridge, my freezer, everything at home is empty. And that's fine. I've got the means to fill it. But you're going to have to make me some time. Because that's what I don't have. Between taking down this tent, trying to get my kids started on our homeschool for the year, trying to get the house back in order because we moved everything back into the house and now the whole downstairs looks like a storage unit. And I've got to get all this straightened out. When am I going to find the time to drive an hour to go to Walmart and get some food or something to put in this house? But if I don't, then Daly's eating saltine crackers and water for dinner because that's what's here. Here comes Ebenezer. <laughs> Yahweh saves. Yes, <laughs> Pulls up in his truck with his wife. He says, well, my wife, she runs a, a tea store over here in Branson. And they're moving us down to Key West to revitalize the store down there that's not doing very well. And so we're getting our camper trailer. And we're going to go on a little bit of a vacation and drive down to Key West. And we've got all this food. That we don't want to take with us. Do you want it? Thank you, Jesus. I said, sure. So he backs his truck up to the tent. This dude has an entire truckload of groceries in totes. Thank you, Jesus. I have 300 pounds of Bismati rice. <laughs> 300 
pounds. <laughs> My daughter loves rice. She can have all the rice she wants. She's been asking almost every night, can we have rice for dinner? Absolutely. <laughs> There's rice. There's tuna. There's all kinds of stuff in here. By the time I took it home and unpacked it all, my cabinets were full. Thank you, Jesus. So then we were taking down the tent. And it was really hot. It was when it was getting up to like 105 degrees. And the first day we were dropping the tent top, I uh, got heat exhaustion. And to the point that we were driving home and I had to have Dell pull over and Jasper's like, you gotta stop at my mom's house and be sick. And ended up spending a couple of days down in the house and, and just having to be in the air conditioning and everything. So then we go out, we've got, to fold, we've got this tent top down, it's laying on the ground, we've got to fold it up. And we put it off as long as we could so that I could recover, but then it was getting to where it's like, it's, it's gonna rain if we don't go do this today. And then that creates a whole nother set of issues. Mm -hmm. So we go out, we gotta get this tent top up, and it's 100 degrees outside. Wow. And it's just me and Dell folding it up, and that thing's heavy. I mean, it's 76 feet across, it's vinyl, and it's, it's, it weighs more than you think it does. So we're using the truck to pull it. You gotta fold it like a fan with these little pie sections it's got. But when the truck pulls it, it gets all wrinkled. So then I'm having to get in between the folds and kick them. And I mean, these, these pies are big enough that it's like I'm pulling it up to here and then sticking my toes in and then trying to kick it. And it's 100 degrees outside. I'm sandwiched in between vinyl. About the time we got three sections folded, I started praying. I was like, Lord, I can't, I can't do this. I'm out here. I'm just pouring sweat. I can't get cool. I can't seem to drink enough water. I'm starting to shake. I'm starting to feel lightheaded. I'm, I'm about to get heat exhaustion again or heat stroke or something. I said, I don't know what you're going to do. I don't have anybody I can call. Everybody I can call is off doing other stuff, jobs and things. They can't come help us. We got to get this done today. Well, I don't know what you're going to do, but you need to do something to help us. Here come Ebenezer. <laughs> now, ten minutes later, here comes Ebenezer. He's got Michael in the truck with him, and it's on a Saturday. So they come out there, and we said, well, we thought you were gone. Went down to Key West, and he said, yeah, we were going down there, and there were some people that were buying land that we were going to live on. And some kind of ministry that he was involved in, and they were doing, I don't know, some kind of commune thing. I don't know what they were doing. Anyway, I don't know. <laughs> and he says he was praying, the guy that was going to be on the deed of the land, he was praying. We were all pulling our money in together to get this land. He said he was praying, and the Lord told him, don't buy that land. I have a different land to get you. He said, so now it's going to be another couple of months before we can go down there. We're lucky for Ebenezer and his family. That meant they missed the hurricane that just hit down here. Yeah, that's awesome. Yes. So we didn't know that at the time. So we're just like, okay, so you're not going to be down there for another couple of months. And he goes, no. And he said, so today me and Michael, we were doing what we always do on Saturdays because he had this thing where he was doing the Messianic thing. And Saturday's really the Sabbath, you know, and everybody knows here knows that. And so... He said a long time ago, he told me this story where he'd been praying and asking the Lord, what am I supposed to do for Sabbath? I want to go to church on Sunday, but what should I do for Sabbath? And he was reading along in Matthew about the, the story of the guy with the crippled hand when Jesus healed him. And Jesus was talking about to the Pharisees, who of you who has a sheep fall in a pit on the Sabbath doesn't pull it out? Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, so it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And so he said, so that's what we do. He said, I go and I find a buddy. He said, lately it's been Michael. And we go find something good to do on the Sabbath. We pray and ask the Lord to lead us to some place where we can do good. He said, so we went for a walk and we were praying. And he said, as he was walking along, he saw something plastic on the ground and he picked it up because it was just trash. You know, and 
He picked it up and it was a steering wheel from a toy car. And he said, the Lord told me that's your mission for today. And he said, well, what's that supposed to mean? So he stuck it in his pocket and they finished their walk. They get back to Ebenezer's place and there's this homeless girl sitting on the doorstep crying. His wife and his kids weren't home. And so him and Michael are talking to the girl and they're like, well, what's wrong? And she's just like, I just I really, really need a ride. And he said, all right, well, we'll give you a ride. I've got my truck here. We'll give you a ride. And where do you need to go? And she said, I need to go to Forsyth. So he takes her out to Forsyth. Well, as they were driving out there, they went past where our tent was and saw me and Dell out there trying to fold up the tent top. And he said, as we drove by, the Lord told both of us at the same time, when you come back, stop and help them. And so he said, I needed my truck. The steering wheel was about the truck. Needed the truck to bring the girl to Forsyth. Needed the truck to help with the tent. Needed the truck to help keep you cool. They got there and saw what was going on with me. And they said, okay, look, you just get in the truck. It's nice and cold. You don't have to wait for it to cool off. Get in there. Cool off. And then when you get to feeling a little bit better, come out here. Because you're the one that knows how to fold this up and just point. <laughs> and what would have taken me and Dell all day long in 100 degree heat, if I could have even made it, was done in an hour and a half. And right as we had the suit, the tent top folded up, we're putting the last bag over by our box truck, it started to rain. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Praise the Lord. See, the Lord's going to call you to stuff. He's not always going to tell you how it's going to work out. Sometimes you're going to be sitting out there trying not to have heat stroke, asking the Lord to do something for you, but he'll always send you an Ebenezer. He's always going to send you your rock of help. We have to stand in the faith of that, that when the Lord says, I need you to go, that instead of saying, well, where are we going? What are we doing? Who are we going to go with? Where, how am I going to get there? That we just say, woo, road trip. Yeah. <laughs> the Lord's looking for people that will just trust him and go. You say, well, blind trust is stupid. Yeah, when you're talking about people, because people are untrustworthy. People are going to let you down. People are going to fail you. People are going to hurt you. But God says, I'm not looking to hurt you. God says, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. Praise we have God. to learn to trust Praise him God. to where I don't need to know the plan. If you say go, I'm going to go. Well, why does God use this person and not that person? Some people, I'm not even in these notes. Some people ask me. This. <laughs> I know. <laughs> People have asked me before when I teach my healing and deliverance classes, they say, well, how much sin can somebody have in their life before somebody stops, before God stops using them? And you see, the question is asked completely wrong. Because you're asking that and, and the implication is, is that I can only have so much sin in my life before God can't use me. And it implies that sinlessness is a qualifier. And it's not. See, now some people, especially out in the internet world, because they're looking for stuff like this, are about to jump all over me. It doesn't matter how much sin you have in your life, because sinlessness was never a qualifier in the first place. God didn't use me to heal people in that tent because I don't have any sin in my life. I do. Don't ask me what it is. I'm not going to tell you. It's not your business. <laughs> It's not because I'm sinless. So why does God use you? Why does God use this person? Why does he use that person? You want to know what the answer is? Because it's the difference between the person says, where, who says, where are we going? What are we doing? How am I going to get there? What's the plan? Show me the map. And the person that says, woo, road trip. Amen. <laughs> Love it. That's the only difference. It's just like Catherine Coleman used to say, God's not looking for golden vessels or even silver vessels. He's looking for yielded vessels. The difference between you not being where you want to be and the person you're looking at that's where you wish you were is that they said yes and you didn't. Come on. It's not a matter of waiting to get educated enough. It's not a matter of waiting to be spiritual enough. You're never going to be spiritual enough. You're never going to purge enough. enough sin out of your life. If you ask God, show me what it is in my life that's displeasing to you, until the day you die, he will always come up with something. Yes, right. Always. 
Always, always. It's a never-ending list because you're human. He's not looking for you to be sinless. He's looking for you to say yes. Follow the word, yes. He's looking for you to quit disqualifying yourself. Not through your sin, but through just saying no. Through saying, I can't. I'm not qualified for that. I don't have the education. Neither do I. Neither do I. I went to seminary and I can't act right. I break every rule that they ever taught me. Jesus. <laughs> but the Lord uses me anyway. And I'm in the process of teaching myself not to use that word anymore. Because you see, the Lord doesn't use people. He doesn't use people. He's looking for people to send out. He's looking to do things through people. To do things through people that won't be recognized, that won't get accolades. There's a revival getting ready to break out in Kirbyville, and me and Dell probably aren't going to be there for it. We'll never get any kind of recognition for it. The Lord sent us ministers that were ready to quit. People, and we eventually learned that Ebenezer was one of them, that were ready to just say, you know what? I'm going to live my life for God, but I'm done with other people because it just isn't working. People are stupid. They're mean. <laughs> They say nasty things. They don't listen when you talk to them. Mm -hmm. I'm done. The Lord kept sending us people like that. And so we'd pray with them and talk to them. And by the time they left, they were encouraged. So now there's two ministries that have been planted in that area by people who were ready to just pack it up and quit. The Lord's looking for people that are willing to go out and reclaim lost territory. There are places in our country that used to be hot spots for the Holy Spirit. And now if you go back to those very same places, they're full of drugs, full of alcohol, full of all kinds of issues and worldly problems. And the Lord is wanting to send people of God to those places to reclaim the territory. People who are willing to do things where you're accomplishing things in the spirit that nobody in the area will ever recognize that you did. People that are willing to go and pray and trust that I did what the Lord told me here to do so I was successful whether people say I was or not. Whether anybody ever sees or recognizes what the Lord used me for here, I'm going to do it. That's right. He's looking for people that will spend time in His presence, that will give Him glory and open themselves up to the Holy Spirit working through them in the way He sees fit. You see, Second Chronicles 16, 9, it says, For the Lord, for the eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth. And we always quote this verse wrong. Tell me how many of you have heard it this way. The eyes of the Lord search to and fro throughout the earth, seeking a heart that's completely His. How many have heard it that way? It's wrong. Completely cut out the middle of the verse, completely cut out the most important part. I heard that verse quoted to me that exactly that way for years. What it actually says is the Lord, the eyes of the Lord search to and fro throughout the earth. Seeking to strongly support the heart that's turned to Him. You see, He's not just looking around to see who loves me and who doesn't. He's looking for people like you so that He can come alongside you and strongly support you in whatever He's calling you to do in ministry. He's not just calling you to live life for Him. He's calling you to go step out and do things for the kingdom. And when you do, He's going to come and He's going to be your foundation. He's going to come and be your support. He's going to come and make sure that you're successful. He'll send you your Ebenezer. Yes. He'll send you whatever you need. He wants to fill you up and do mighty works through you. See, but we don't Step out and do things for God because 
We have this notion that God wants to use me. And I'm guilty of saying it all the time. I caught myself saying it three times so far. Well, God's going to use you. But He doesn't use people. And that mentality, that wrong thinking, is part of why we don't step out and do things for the Lord. Because you see, if the Lord's going to use me, that means I need to be useful. And so I need to make myself useful to the Lord. So I have to get rid of all of this sin, and then the Lord can use me. I have to get this education, and then the Lord can use me. I have to get more faith, and then the Lord can use me. But you know, I've read this Bible cover to cover several times. And I've never, not one time, seen a verse anywhere where the Lord uses somebody. He wants to use me for the kingdom. He wants to use me as a vessel for his glory. But there's no reference to the Bible anywhere in that. See, what the Bible says in Ephesians 5.18, he says he fills people. In Isaiah 58.11, he says he leads people. In 2 Corinthians 1.21, it says he anoints people. And sometimes we think, well, if I had an anointing, I would be useful. You do have an anointing. You were anointed the moment you got saved. You see, we get confused about what anointing is. We think that it's this special calling, this special ability that God gives us and make it into this ooh kind of thing, the anointing. <laughs> Pray for an anointing. Pursue an anointing. And then we get weird. You see, we stray away from this and we start getting weird. When we start treating anointing like it's something I have to acquire, we start doing stuff like laying on people's graves, trying to absorb their anointing. Quit being weird. Amen. Amen. Where do you ever see that in the Bible? Elisha did not go lay on Elijah's grave. The only time you ever see that happening is when you see Elijah laying on the dead body of a boy and bringing him back to life. Jesus laying his hands on a dead boy and bringing him back to the life. Amen. So unless you're trying to resurrect the dead, quit hanging out in the graveyard. That's not where your anointing is going to be. Right. Amen. And some people want to get a holier than thou attitude. Well, I'm not one of these people that goes chasing anointings. But I'm waiting to receive my mantle. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, if you want a mantle, go buy one. <laughs> you can get it on Amazon. <laughs> you see, we find all these excuses, but it's, well, I've, I've got to make myself useful. See, God can't use me if I don't have an anointing. See, an anointing is being set apart. That's what it means. You go look it up in the Greek, that's what it means. It's to be set apart for the purposes of God. You see, we had all these things in the tabernacle that were just things. They made bowls. They made a table. It's just a bowl. It's just a table. What made it special was that God anointed it. What does that mean? That means He chose it to be used for His purposes. So now something that before was just a table, now it's sacred. A bowl that was just a bowl yesterday is sacred now. Because it's been set apart for God to use. You don't have to go seeking an anointing. You don't have to go lay on Smith Wigglesworth's grave. You don't have to go chasing after some preacher and wait for him to put his mantle on you when he dies. All you have to do is say yes to God. And when you start saying yes to God, he'll start working through you. Because you've set yourself apart. I'm here for your glory. I'm here for your purpose. The problem when we view ourselves as being used by God is that the things we use are disposable. They're things that are here today and they're cast off tomorrow. You know, I, I use a plate. And when I don't want it anymore, I give it to Goodwill or I throw it away. He said, well, not everything I use is disposable. My car is not disposable. It's not. Yeah. Your car is expensive. 
your car is very useful, but when it stops working like it's supposed to, what do you do? You get rid of it. I don't want it anymore. If it's completely broke down through a rod or something, you just take it to the scrapyard and throw it away. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> Everything that we use eventually gets thrown away. That's why we as people don't like to be used. Well, I don't like that person. They're just using me. Well, what do you mean when you say that? Well, they want me around so long as I'm serving their purposes. And when I stop serving their purposes, they're going to throw me away. Oh, like a paper plate or a car or a hammer. And then the head goes flying off and now I have no use for this. So... <laughs> This goes in the trash. God doesn't use you. When we say God uses us, what we're really saying is that I'm, I'm inconsequential. I don't really mean anything. I'm just a means to an end. I'm just the tool that God's using until he doesn't need me anymore. When he's done hammering nails, he's not going to use me anymore because I'm just a hammer. And when he gets to where he's hammered all the nails, then all the hammers just go away and we don't use them anymore. And that's why we get weird theology. Quit being weird. <laughs> just read the Bible. Well, we don't need the, New, the Old Testament anymore. You can really just rip that out. And throw it away. We don't use that anymore. Yeah, use. It's a tool that's not serving my purposes as I see them anymore. So just get rid of it. Except for the part where you don't even know who Jesus is without the Old Testament. Amen. That's right. Yeah. It's all the work. No matter what. Well, the Lord doesn't use apostles anymore. That was just in the biblical times. He anoints all kinds of people to be apostles. He anoints all kinds of people to be preachers, prophets, teachers. He uses all the fivefold ministry all the time. He uses all kinds of other ministries all the time. It doesn't go by the wayside. People told us when we bought our tent, tent ministry is out. Nobody wants to go to a tent anymore. Nobody's going to go to a tent. It's like, really? Ten years ago, that sounded really good. Now you've got Greg Locke down in North Carolina that's got thousands of people showing up all the time. The guy that made my tents, making them for Mario Murillo. Mario Murillo just bought four of them. Last I checked, that guy's not an idiot, and he wouldn't be spending tens of thousands of dollars on tents that people aren't coming to. Amen. Mm -hmm. You see, people want to cast stuff off all the time. And then they treat you like, yeah, God wants to cast you off. Well, your time has passed. God's not doing that anymore. It's time for something new to come along. That's not how God works. Amen. He's not using you. He wants to anoint you. He wants to work with you. Mark 16, 20, it says, And they went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord was working with them, confirming the word by his signs that followed. You see, one of the harshest words my husband has ever given me Is that if things aren't working out for you in your ministry, if they're not working out for you spiritually, God's not the problem. Mm -hmm. Well, why isn't this working out? The problem is, is that God is working with you. He's not using you. Right. Yeah. A hammer doesn't get to decide whether or not I'm going to pound nails with it today. I just decide on my own. Either I'm picking this up and using it or I'm not. And so if the hammer's not getting used, the issue's with me, the user. Yep. You see, but when I'm working with a person, the issue isn't always me. Sometimes I can't work with a person because they won't work with me. See, we're not telling God, yes, he comes alongside you. He's not going to force you. Right. Mm -hmm. He's not going to make you do things that you don't want to do. We could have told him, no, I don't want to go out to Kirby Bill's a small little town. And anybody out there, I don't want to go there. Okay. Don't cry me when somebody else has their tent set up there. And you, oh, you didn't use me to put my tent out there. <laughs> the Lord works with you, and in, in one case, he even 
Stephen took Gideon and put him on like clothes. You want to talk about yielding to the Holy Spirit. Saying yes to God. Get to the place where you say yes to God. Where you're so yielded to Him. That He takes you and just puts you on like clothes. And now He's just walking around in a Wayne suit. When you step out and do things for the Lord. You don't have to worry about it. I don't understand worrying about things. I am a world class worrier. If it was an Olympic sport. I would be too old to be in the Olympics anymore, but I'd be coaching the people that are getting medals. <laughs> All right, I'm past my prime. I've got too much of Jesus in my life, but I can coach you in how to worry. I can have you worrying all day long tomorrow. <laughs> the Lord's working with you. He's going to come alongside you. He's going to guide you along the way. The Bible says that the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. Well, my steps aren't being ordered right now. Well, then where are you getting hung up in your righteousness? Well, see, see, Lene, you're just contradicting what you said. It's my righteousness that's the problem. So I've got to get rid of all this sin in my life, and then the Lord will use me. No, because you're not using your own righteousness. You ain't got none. You think you do. You ain't got none. You're like the little kid that's got three cents in your pocket, and you think you're going to go back in. No, you're not. You think you've got money. You don't got money. You just got a little bit of copper. It ain't worth nothing. Nobody's going to sell you nothing for three cents. That's what our righteousness is. It's the little three cents you can't even buy yourself a piece of bubble gum with it. Say, so, well, my righteousness is out of order. This is because you're not adopting the righteousness of Christ. You're not accepting what he's done for you. You're so focused on your sin. I've got to quit doing this. And I've got to quit doing this. And I've got to quit doing this. Instead of just getting in your prayer closet and saying, Father, I need the blood of Jesus to be poured out on my life. And anything that's displeasing to you, just cover it and help wash it away. Say, so, well, then you're teaching people to just walk around in sin. You can just... Do whatever you want. Live life however you want. Trust me, if you pursue the presence of God, the sin's going to start going away automatically. And a lot of times when we're not getting worked through, I almost said it again. When the Lord's not filling us, when He's not anointing us, when He's not coming alongside us, it's not because i got to get rid of all this sin in my life because i got to do all of this stuff. It's because I've run away from His presence. Because I got so far into it, now we've come up against the sin that I don't want Him to wash away. I don't want Him to get rid of it. I like it. I want to keep doing it. And so then that moves us away from the presence of God. And the further away you get from the presence of God, the further away you are from your righteousness. Because it's not your righteousness, it's Jesus'. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's why we're able to get things from God. I'm sorry, I'm going all over the place. I'm going to quit some. We're trying to get righteousness from ourselves instead of righteousness from God. We're trying to view ourselves as being good enough instead of just saying, well, God has put me here and so he's just going to do whatever he's got to do to make sure that my flaws... And things are covered over. I'm not a good public speaker, but the Lord speaks through me because he's called me to preach. Whatever the Lord's called you to do, he's going to enable you to do it. Or he'll bring people alongside you. He'll bring you an Ebenezer to help you out. When you're too weak and puny to fold the tent top that he told you to buy, he'll send you an Ebenezer. An Ebenezer to do it for you. Amen. Say, so, well, the Lord's called me to open up a business and I don't know anything about business. Well, start praying for the Lord to send you an Ebenezer. The Lord's called me to reach out to homeless people. I don't know nothing about homeless people. Pray for the Lord to bring you an Ebenezer. Amen. He set you apart for a purpose. And I'm not saying he's going to set you apart. He already has. You've already been anointed. You've had an anointing on your life your entire life. He's just waiting for you to pick it up. Mm -hmm. To accept it. That's true. To come to the place where you admit that I'm nothing and no one without God. That's right. Come on now. And I can't do anything without him, but I'm going to pick up this anointing and trust that if you set me apart for this, you're going to work it out. And all I have to do is seek your presence. All I have to do is love you. 
I don't need to focus on my sin. I don't need to focus on anything that I'm doing wrong. Because if I just come into your presence, all of that stuff will start falling away automatically. Amen. Just through applying the blood of Jesus to my life. Well, how do you apply the blood of Jesus? It's real easy. You get down on your knees, or you sit down in a chair, or you stand up, or you get in whatever position you want to. And you say, Father, I plead the blood of Jesus over my life. That's right. Because you see, the blood of Jesus is like soap. If you want to be clean, it's not enough to know somebody that has soap. It's not enough to know where the shower and the soap is. It's not enough to know that I can go buy it down there anytime I want. It's not enough to sit next to clean people. It's not enough to carry the soap around in your pocket, put it in your bag, keep it under your hat, throw it in the cup holder in your car. If you want to be clean, you have to apply it. The blood of Jesus is the same way. Well, if the blood of Jesus is so powerful, why are there so many evil people in the world? Because if you want the blood of Jesus to work, you have to apply it. Yes. And there's millions and millions of people in the world that refuse to apply the blood of Jesus and wonder why they're dirty. Yes. God wants to move through you. I'm going to close this out. I'm just looking for the door. <laughs> <laughs> He's not waiting for you to be educated. He's not waiting for some event in your life for you to reach some particular age. He's not waiting for you to have a certain amount of money, a certain amount of resources, to know certain people, to live in a certain place. He's waiting for your willingness. He's waiting for you to just say, yeah. He's waiting... For you to stop leaning on your own understanding and trust Him. Amen. He's waiting for you to say yes to what He's called you to do. Even when you don't understand it and you don't see the full plan. I understand being in that place. Me and Della are in the same place. We don't fully understand what the next part of our ministry is going to look like. We don't know what's going to happen next. We don't know where we're going to put the tent up next. But we know that we seek the presence of God. That we make a conscious effort to turn our hearts to Him. And so He's going to come and strongly support us no matter what we do. Not because we're great people of faith. I'm not. Most people that see me up front preaching an evangelist would be shocked at how little faith I really have. How unspiritual I really am. He's not going to come and strongly support us because we have some deep spiritual insight where nobody's ever seen this in the Bible before. It's because we said yes and we made ourselves available. And it's that simple for you. Just saying, you know what, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. I'm just making myself available to you. Fill me, work with me, anoint me, whatever you want to do. God's on the move and He wants... To do things like he's never done before. He's bringing revival to this country and to the world. The clock for when that's going to happen is ticking away every second. It's getting closer and closer. People are seeing more and more visions of vast sweeping revival in the world. It's getting easier and easier to see miracles happen when people pray. Churches that have never seen miracles before are seeing people get healed, seeing bondages broken. Seeing circumstances change, financial situations change. I don't know about you, but I want to be on the front row. That's right. I don't want to be sitting way up in the nosebleed section trying to see what God's doing. I want to be on the front row. I want to say yes to God. I don't want to miss out on what he's doing. And so there's three things you can do to help support people like me and Dell to help support any ministries. First one is you can pray. You never have too many people praying for you. You can never have too many people praying for a ministry. The devil tries to get in there and mess things up all the time. Amen. It's valuable to have people interceding for you. The second thing you can do is give. When you see the Lord working through a ministry, give to it. Yes. 
And not just giving your finances. Give to the Lord. Give your time. Give your resources. And not just to other people's ministries. When the Lord calls you to do something, put your money where your mouth is. I want you to give to homeless people. Go buy stuff to give to the homeless people. You see, we think that when we give to the Lord, it has to be money and it has to be given at church. It doesn't. You can give the Lord whatever you want. I used to know a woman that she was on food stamps. Well, I don't have any money to be putting in the tithe because my social security check just barely covers my bills and then I'm on food stamps. So she started giving 10% of her groceries away. She said, I can't give the food stamp money away because that's illegal, but I can spend it all and then take 10% of what I bought and go take it down to a food pantry or give it to somebody that I know is even less fortunate than me. You can find a way to tithe if you want to tithe. You can find a way to give if you want to give. It's important to give to the Lord. When we start giving to Him, what's the word said? It says, give unto the Lord and He'll give back to you, pressed down, shaken together and overflowing. He's not a God of lack. He's not going to just leave you 10% short. He's not going to leave you where I gave away 10% of my groceries so the last three days of the month I'm fasting. He's not that kind of God. You can give. The other thing you can do is to go. And not just go to services. Not just go to ministries. But go out into the world. Tell people about Jesus. It's not hard. I used to think it was hard. And then the Lord told me one day. He said, witnessing is easy. He said, all you have to do is when people ask you about your life, don't leave me out. Amen. It takes more effort for you to leave me out of your story than it is for you to just include me. Tell them about the Ebenezer. Don't tell the story like, yeah, I need groceries. And some dude showed up and had groceries. Tell him you prayed about it. Yes. And this is an answer to prayer. Mm -hmm. Don't tell people he sent some nice guy to help. That some nice guy just showed up to fold up the tent. Tell him that you prayed about it and I sent someone. Don't just say, well, my life used to be messed up and now it's not. Tell them, my life isn't messed up because I found Jesus. And Jesus helped me get it back on track. Jesus changed this in my marriage. Jesus changed this in my career. Jesus changed this in my finances. He changed this in my life. He changed it in my attitude. I used to want to kill myself and now I don't because Jesus loves me. Amen. Go into the world and preach the gospel. That doesn't mean you need a pulpit. You can preach the gospel at Walmart. You can preach the gospel at a wall at a yard sale. Yep. That's right. Come on up. That's right. You can preach the gospel anywhere you go. I used to have a friend, this is the last thing the story I'm gonna tell. I used to have a friend, we used to joke with him that we were gonna do an outreach and make him stand outside of Walmart and make people give him donations for using anything in their grocery sack to preach a five minute sermon. Cause I'm telling you that dude and everything was a sermon. Everything, <laughs> Jesus is like everything and everyone. It's like, well, here's some cheese, Jason. How's Jesus like cheese? And he'd always come up with something. You'd be driving down the road with him. We were driving to St. Louis one day for a conference. And we were complaining about the traffic. And he goes, you know, life is like traffic, but Jesus is the stoplight. <laughs> we're like, excuse me. <laughs> he says, you can be driving down the busiest freeway in the world, but if you listen to the stoplight, you're going to be okay. That's right. <laughs> if you ignore it, all you have waiting for you is death and destruction. <laughs> like, are you serious? He's talking about mowing the lawn one day. You know, sometimes walking with Jesus is like mowing the lawn. Shut up, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> you can preach about anything. Anything can turn into a little sermon for somebody. Just ask the Lord and you start. He'll make you laugh with it. He'll have fun with it. Just ask Him, Lord, lead me to somebody and then make something, anything, into a way for them me to tell them about Jesus. And stuff will just start coming to you. It's unbelievable. They'll bring things up that you never dreamed they would bring up. Or some little something will happen and the Lord will be like, tell them it's like me. Tell them it's like me. Jesus used parables for a reason. Amen. You see, we don't realize it in the Bible because... 
they're biblical parables, so we automatically associate them with the Bible. You don't, we don't think about it the way that the people were sitting there. That this is the equivalent of Jason sitting outside the grocery store. You know, the kingdom of God is like wheat, and you're what? <laughs> <laughs> The kingdom of God is like seed that fell on the ground. There's something wrong with this dude. Like, <laughs> really? The kingdom of God is like an evil land baron. What? <laughs> it's like owing a debt you can't pay. Man, I don't owe nobody nothing. What are you talking about? You can turn anything into a sermon. And these people remembered the parables, not because it's some little cute story, but because it was weird. <laughs> you don't have Pharisees standing up in the synagogue talking about dogs eating their own vomit and stuff. And it sounds gross, but you know what? You use vomit to preach, people are going to remember that sermon for the rest of their life. <laughs> I went to church this one time and this chick. Started talking about throwing up and dogs eating it, oh. and that this is like people in the kingdom of God and returning to their sin. Are you serious? It's like, yes, I am. And now you're 60 years old and you're still telling that story. <laughs> now remember, it. Jesus told that story over 2,000 years ago, and here I am still telling it. You can use anything to witness to people. We make it hard because we don't want to do it. So we look for excuses. Mm -hmm. We don't want to go because we're scared. Well, what are people going to think of me? Yeah. What if nothing happens? What if something does? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You never know what the Lord's using you for. And sometimes from man's perspective, it looks like you're being unsuccessful. Well, I've been trying this and trying this and trying this. And all this time, I've reached one person. One. And maybe to you that seems like a failure, but for that one person, that was a life-altering moment. Yes. Yes. You completely changed the trajectory of somebody's life. Yes. That's true. And that's not something to just sweep under the chair and say it's nothing. Amen. God's wanting to use you. So I've told you, put on some music. I finally found the door. At least I just found one. I'm going through it. It's new and we got to quit. <laughs> <laughs>